is the CCFI Summer Scholar teaching a course entitled Practicing Transdisciplinarity Methodology in a Post-Foundational Age. Transdisciplinarity, like CCFI itself, is queerly transitive in its relation with canonical knowledge formations and disciplinary boundaries, pushing intelligibility, as Haver puts it so eloquently, to the brink of invention. Transdisciplinarity articulates a gap between knowledge and public that is of interest. That gap, articulated as an aporia, as Derrida might argue, brings us in touch with borders and provides what he calls a new thinking of the possible. At the end of Precarious Life, Butler proposes to reinvigorate the intellectual project of critique and create a sense of the public in which oppositional voices are not feared, degraded, or dismissed. She asserts that cultural criticism's task is to return us to the human where we do not expect to find it. In other words, we must consider critically areas that have been deemed unthinkable, debate that which is regarded as unspeakable, and grieve lives relegated to the unlivable. Surely, these key notions about the renewed importance of critique and the central role to be played by problematization, both in getting smart and in getting lost, mm -hmm. is for many of us the central contribution of Patty Lather's scholarship. Patty Lather is a professor of the Cultural Foundations in Education program, School of Educational Policy and Leadership at Ohio State University where she teaches qualitative research in education, <coughs> feminist methodology, and gender. She's held visiting positions at the University of British Columbia, Gothenburg University, and the Danish Pedagogy Institute, as well as a sabbatical appointment at the Humanities Research Institute, University of California, Irvine. She was the recipient of a 1989 Fulbright to New Zealand. And Dr. Lather is the author of three books, Getting Smart, Feminist Research and Pedagogy Within the Postmodern, Troubling the Angels, Women Living with HIV AIDS, and Getting Lost, Feminist Efforts Towards Doubled Science. Articles and book chapters have appeared in various venues related to her interests in post-critical methodology, feminist ethnography, and post-structuralism. Her in-process book, Engaging Social Science, Policy from the Side of the Messy is under contract with Peter Lyon Publishers. Please join me in welcoming Patty Lather here today. Thanks, Mary. I was going to call the new book Getting Messy, but I thought the Getting Smart, Getting Lost, Getting Messy was the too much. I, uh, this is like AERA. You people must come in here and sit down. <laughs> there's plenty of room up here. There's room over there. Get in here and make yourself comfortable. There's even a chair there, Gordon, if you were going to read. <laughs> Beth, 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 you sit right there. <laughs> All right, well, I understand how quickly an hour goes, so I'm just going to jump right into it. Uh, this is a paper that brings together a 2001 trip from South Africa, the 2007 publication of Getting Lost, and again, it's very important to contrast that with the 91 Getting Smart, if you want to track the trajectory of my work. And, uh, and my 30 year, it's hard for me to say that, 30 year interest in feminist methodology to ask questions of what it means to make connections across differences of history, geography, languages, disciplines, identity positions, and theoretical, theoretical investments in qualitative research and education. And of course I could go on with that list, but that'll give you a feel for it. So the first section of the paper is called White Woman Goes to Africa and Loses Her Voice. <laughs> In 2001, I was one of three U.S. academics invited to serve at the University of Durban, Westville, and South Africa School of Educational Studies as a consultant in the development of research capacity for what was termed an historically disadvantaged university. Funding came from a USAID program, and it was clear that my background in critical and feminist qualitative work in education was the reason for the invitation. Keep, c c let these folks in. And you people who are in the, in the seats, get up here closer. Nobody in the halls. And somebody is going to have to take that chair or I'm going to assign it. 
All right, such a brief brought me face to face, I can talk loud while they're coming in, with the contradictions of white expertise and the necessary complicities and forms of dominance involved in addressing someone as a subaltern. Uh, this was particularly complicated in that many at UDWI discovered had originally thought I was black as I deal with issues that, in the words of someone who interviewed me, do not really concern a white woman. Thrilled that my work was so resonant, but bothered about whether I had misrepresented myself, I was mostly disoriented by such a response. Were such issues not exactly mine as a white woman well-schooled in U.S. anti-racist politics? Was I performing myself out of what Handel Wright has called the assumed and unremarked whiteness of my feminism, as he, in, in work he noted on my work on critical pedagogy? Why did Wright read me as perfunctory, indirect, several times removed in dealing with race, while I was read in a South African context as black? <laughs> What's going on here, to echo Patricia? Hill Collins echoing Marvin Gaye in her writing on black feminist thought and the politics of postmodernism. <coughs> Losing my voice at the end of an intense week, my title for anything I write, I joked, must be white woman goes to Africa and loses her voice. This was not at all because I was unhearable in a Spivakian sort of can the subaltern speak sort of way, but quite the opposite. I talk so much and so loudly over the excitement in the room I like to think that for the first time in my life I was unable to speak. Three moments stand out for me from this short time in South Africa. One, a late week tour of a township in a Mercedes. Two, the lived experience of how I could not but be the face of neocolonialism in post-apartheid South Africa. And three, what it meant to try nonetheless to be of use, particularly to the 20 or so doctoral students I talked with about their research projects. Witnessing the greatest disparities of wealth in the world was the intended itinerary of my Mercedes tour. From the shanty towns, both organized and not, to the gated communities that spread to the ocean, surrounded by shopping centers so fancy they put those of Southern California to shame, I moved between shattering poverty and gross wealth. Chauffeured by a faculty member who lived in a house of great beauty, I was lost in trying to make sense of how she managed to teach students of whom she told tales of breaking rules to let those who lived without electricity into classrooms at night to study for exams. Countless such stories of ever-present jarring disparities could be told, even from a week. But I want to focus on what losing my voice might be made to mean in terms of the ethics of engagement in the zone of post-colonial cultural contact. Um, this is, is a sort of where you situate yourself in the, in the address of another, summoned by another, where categories must be examined, opened to its others, in a way that I'm arguing for is a kind of letting go or getting lost. Never quite reaching appropriation, relations are on the way to becoming something other. And that phrase will resonate as, as on the way to becoming something other. Um, so what is this uh, antithetical to individual rights, yet insisting that responsibility begins with singularity? Uh, collectivity is historicized, contingent against any authority of identity or essence. Taking the place of something absent that may never have existed, it is moving towards a kind of community that's premised in being named, posited, uh, a foundationalist basis for some sort of reconciliation. A kind of miming or as if is enacted in such dispropriative address. Compelled to address oneself as an other. Speaking or being heard to speak in languages not one's own. Identification is fractured and displaced. Positional stability is disrupted. There is more, much more to tell here in such a scene of testimony where we speak or are heard to speak uh, in ways we do not understand. A radical exile of self is at work where we allow ourselves to be transformed by being split, lost, doubled across radically uneven social spaces, zones of unequal access to hegemonic language. How does this help me understand my experience in South Africa?